partners in Naked Eye Productions since 1988. Tina Antonio and Jane Wagner's critically acclaimed work has been screened at museums, film festivals, educational institutions, and broadcast in countries throughout the world. Jane and Tina began their filmmaking collaboration as graduate students in the Stanford University Film Program, where Wagner produced the award-winning short film Hearts and Quarks, and DeFelice Antonio made Living with AIDS, which debuted to national audiences in July 1988, the first season of POV. Jane Wagner and Tina DeFelice Antonio, welcome. Good to be here. So tell me, you have been making documentary films for 23 years. <laughs> Thanks for doing the math. <laughs> if I do the math correctly. What, what first drew you into the field? For me, I think it was um, the power of certain films that I saw. I saw uh, Barbara Koppel's um, Harlan County, and uh, I was at um, graduate school in England. And it was just seeing how film could really bring to life this sense of voices and experience that you don't get in academic writing. And it just had all these ripples and repercussions and discussion afterwards that then engaged the audience actively. Um, and, and I think that's really the start. And then Harvey Milk was probably another seminal film for the same reasons. How do you guys work together? Do one of you um, shoot and the other does sound? Do you go back and forth? I know that a lot of filmmaking teams sometimes switch or sometimes, like the Maisels, you know, um, David Maisels is a great sound recordist and wanted to do sound, and Al loves, you know, being behind the camera. How do you, how do you work together as a filmmaking team? We produce, direct, and write pretty seamlessly. For some reason, we don't have real conflicts. And if we do, it's kind of fun because it's a creative friction. So we've been really lucky over the years. In terms of production, um, it depends on the budget and the circumstances. Sometimes we'll hire a uh, crew, like ba basically camera and sound. In a lot of situations, I'll shoot and Jane will do sound. So we can sort of become a very compact unit. How has your filmmaking changed over the course of your uh, career, the course of your collaboration? Not just with technology, but with your own approach to storytelling. Um, the types of stories that you're, that you're drawn to tell. Um, talk a little bit about that. I think we still approach our films in the same way, but I think we've tried to hone, hone our skills, get better and better at it, and to enjoy the process more. For me, the change has been more a sense of n knowing the process more. Um, it doesn't mean that the process is any easier, um, and every film has its own challenges, but really, having a sense of the process, being more confident in the process, that this is all part of the process, <laughs> this too shall pass it Being all. less freaked out yeah. by, you know, th when things don't go according to your expectations and just going with the flow, f seeing any, anything that might go askew, looking, that as, looking at that as an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just being more flexible yeah. creatively and not so, not so uptight, not exactly. so nervous about things. I guess it's a confidence thing that comes with experience. How do you think um, you gain trust with your subjects? I mean, there's some folks who show up without the camera, you know, and s who spend time with their subjects before they begin shooting. There's some folks who just start shooting right away. It sounds to me like you guys sort of find your subjects, you, are, you, have, you know, come to this mutual understanding about what the, the point of the documentary is, and then you proceed with the shooting from there. Is, it, is, is there ever a gap or, or, or a moment where you need to sort of step back from the process of filmmaking and just engage in, in getting people to trust you? We really try to find a topic and then find people that will get something, mm. that it's a mutually, uh, it's a collaborative process, it's a, it's a mutual relationship. And so they understand that participating in this project is because they believe in something strongly, because they feel like they really do have something to say, so that there isn't that sense in which we're coming in to make a film about you. It's more that, you know, we know that you have something to say and something that we think is really powerful to say, and we would like to, you know, be a part of, of uh, amplifying that, as, as Tina said earlier. And so there's always been that sense of really trying to find that mutual relationship 
they know that we're manipulating the subject matter. We know they know we're making choices, but people feel, by and large, we've been really lucky. They feel that they got something out of the experience, and also they feel like their their stories were were told in a way that they felt good about, mm -hmm. not because they weren't critical, but because they were accurate. And so we've been really lucky like that, from Dorothy Allison, who's a writer, to the girls and girls like us, mm -hmm. to Todd and the people at Living with AIDS to people in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, we've been really, really lucky, and part of that is what's enriching to us. Yeah. It's feeling like, okay, we, you know, we did it. Um, they're happy and the audience is getting something out of it, and we had a good time making the film. So that's, you know, that's part of why we do it. I know it's that passion of connecting, connecting with people individually, and having that connection flow over to an audience. Next, Living With AIDS, Tina DeFeliciantonio, director. So I felt it was important to show a gay man uh, uh, in his community with his loved ones uh, dealing with AIDS, showing the issues and concerns and, and demystifying AIDS and humanizing it, showing the human impact and showing the strength and what can be done in, in caring compassionately for our sick and dying, whether it's AIDS or any other disease. I think Americans, uh, America has a lot to learn in uh, how to deal with our sick and dying. I mean, I would hope it would humanize the disease. We're not talking about numbers. We're not talking about things in the abstract. These were people that needed a community, a compassionate community response to the epidemic throughout the United States and now throughout the world. Um, so that's what I hope to engender, uh, both educating as well as creating an understanding for each person who would watch the film, the need to participate, the need to be a community member. We started working on this film about six years ago. There was a lot in the media about teenagers and girls, and, and it just seemed that there wasn't really any voice given to the teen experience, and we thought it was really important to actually hear from these girls and to see what was really going on in their lives. Tell me a bit about that film and the young women in that film because the, the two have an interesting sort of parallel because it's some it's 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 somewhat about sexual mores and values and you know what is what it means to be good and you know what it means to be bad. How did you find those young women and what was your in intention behind making Girls Like Us? At that at the time we sort of started um, Girls Like Us. There was a lot of stuff in the paper about teenage pregnancy. A Madonna sex book was coming out, the whole virgin whore thing, but you'd never heard from teenage girls themselves, particularly not working class teenage girls. Um, and so that was really our goal, was to set out and, and give voice. And um, it just so, ha and we really thought about how we could have that kind of entree into a community and, and that genuineness, how we could be accepted so that we could have the openness and the honesty to really portray that. And so um, Tina grew up in South Philly, and within the boundary of South Philly, there are, are these distinct communities, so you could get a lot of diversity within one neighborhood. Within, I mean, all the girls live blocks from each other. They didn't know each other yeah. outside of the film, but they all uh, live blocks from each other. We did community screenings of Girls Like Us with POV, and it was a great experience. You could really see how um, these characters affect people and really give them tools to talk about topics and issues that they might not otherwise. Um, I, think, I, I think what we try to do, following up on what Jane was saying, is engage the audience so that they can engage with the subject matter on their own terms. And so we try to raise questions more than to provide answers in our films. And in, in, in that way, th that's the way we sort of try to engage audiences by not providing you know, the solutions to, to questions. And that's, it's not up to me, I don't have solutions. I can only, I can only pose questions. I can't believe I I'm going to have another baby. Now i got to go home and i got to hear my mom and dad again. They're going to keep ragging on me, telling me, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. And I'm not doing it. And who's the father of this baby? Um, this kid, Tommy, from what I know. If I'm only, if I'm only between, like, 
two and four weeks, you know, then it's his. If not, then it's my ex-boyfriend Gabe's. And we, me and him broke up like a month and a half ago. And if it's his, I gotta go tell him, you know? But the only problem is, is he's black. <laughs> and my mom and dad are like, they don't care that he's black. They don't want me to have a half black, half white baby. And we actually had a screening recently of Girls Like Us oh, in yeah. New York. Um, and it was great because uh, the girls were there, they came. Mm. And they're not girls anymore, they're in their 30s. How are they doing? Good. Really? Well, um, Lisa is now, she's done graduate work, she's a counselor with kids in a grade school. Owns her own home, still not married, <laughs> but in a relationship. Just really a strong, independent woman. And uh, Anna is a lawyer on Long Island. She does uh, copyright issues. And she loves it. And she loves it. Again, not married yet. Very strong, very great. And Diana is fantastic. She has this um, wonderful job where she's really appreciated. She gets paid really well. She really runs well. a uh, an independent living home for severely disabled adults. And she loves the people that she takes care of. She runs the home. She likes the people who work under her. And actually, they wanted to promote her to uh, be a manager. But she's like, I get paid less <laughs> money. They won't pay me overtime if I do that. Um, and uh, she supports her family. And her Camise, who was the father of her first child, they broke up for a while, but they're back together again. Really great couple. And he's so supportive mm. of her. And um, they're in good shape. Except right, they're all, they're all doing well. And Raylene was uh, in a car accident. And died. And died. Which yeah. is always, which, so it was really hard watching the film afterwards. And it was the second person. I mean, Todd died while I was making the film and living with AIDS. So that was pretty devastating for my age, getting close to someone who, yeah. who died and seeing him die. I'd never seen anybody die before. And Raylene, of course, she stayed, you know, she stayed with us through the production. But a few years later, um, passed away, and it it's always difficult to watch those films for the first time after after people are gone. What advice would you give to um, first-time filmmakers, emerging filmmakers, folks who may either you know be coming to filmmaking as a as a new endeavor or coming out of graduate school? Um, what kind of advice would you give to a new filmmaker? You have to come with a passion and you have to come passionately about what you want to say. And those are the most important things. Um, and if you can maintain that sense of passion, that sense of wonder, the sense of empathy, um, then I think you have all the skills that you need to begin uh, making a film. The money is endlessly hard. Um, and I think that you know, there was a while when documentaries were the thing, you know, supersize me, you can make money from this. And, uh... Those are far and few between. And, yeah, and that's never But it's important for people to be realistic about that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very hard profession. Um, and I think, I think people know that now going into it. You know, when we were graduate students, our professor said, give yourself a good five years to establish yourself, maybe 10. We're like, okay, you know, this we is hard. But we're, we're like, we're what like, happened? 10 years, 12, 15. We're like, this is not getting any easier. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's been interesting because the, you know, the world has changed so much. And, yes. you know, there's so much more, uh, you know, opportunities, so many more opportunities for young people to get involved in television and cable and the internet and so forth and so on. But, um, you know, the, the jobs, there are more of these jobs, more ability to just pick up a film and make your, make your own, pick up a camera and make your own film because of the technology, the barriers to entry have lowered. Right. But also this, the market, even though uh, there are more opportunities, it's much more segmented. So there are the budgets to support the kind of work that we like to do are far and few between. And um, so, you know, if you're young, uh, make some decisions about what's important to you. That's yeah. what I would say. What kind of lifestyle you want, be realistic about it, and, uh, and make some choices and, and be flexible, but try to live by them. You know, enter into it with, with eyes wide open.